These university students and have challenged the mayor and the police commissioner of the need for zero tolerance and for counter-terrorism security. This election is for who runs late London and the mayor and the assembly. It's not who actually runs the Labour Party, I expect that will probably come out later. Um, the community has the same concerns as do most of the Londoners, as it's clear from the London Jewish Forum manifesto, which we have here on the table in front of us. Concerned about housing, transport, police and security, and everything else. But with those concerns, other dimensions come forward from the faith and cultural requirements and expectations of the community. And we have to make sure those are addressed. And I believe that we have in Sadiq a mayoral candidate who shows his friendship to and understanding of the needs of the community, an understanding of friendship that comes from his own beliefs and his interfaith work over many years in government and opposition. And I believe in myself, you know you'll have an assembly member who will stand up for you, and whoever it may be, hold the mayor to the pleasures they make to you, as I have over the last four years as your assembly member. terrible things are being done to Jews in Germany, and many members, probably of your own families, were fleeing into this area. The road outside was known as Finchley Strasse. It was long before I came to this part of London. For a long time, I thought that what I love about living in Hampstead, the liberalism, the love of the arts, the commitment to scholarship, the respect for intellectualism, and for justice, was in fact an inheritance of the immigrants from Nazi Germany. Helen Marcus put me straight on this a few years ago. She said, Stephen, no, the reason why we came to this area was because these values were already established there. I've been um, back, I first came to this area as a student at university. I've been back for <coughs> year, 15 years now. I'm very proud to live in a part of London in a society which is so strongly committed humanity and humane values. I'm proud to be living in a society so well integrated that my Jewish neighbour, the lawyer Lenny Hoffman, could rise to be a Lord Justice of Appeal. I used to have part of his judgment on me, but I could control all this by heart, inspiring words. I'm a Buddhist, I have been for 40 years. Uh, I'm very proud and glad to be living in a strong Jewish community. Good evening. Um, my name is John Baskin. I'm the chairman of Barnet UKIP. I'm standing in for Joseph Langton, who's abroad, who is our candidate. He's a young man of 27. He's the youngest in UKIP uh, to stand. And he's Italian born. He has uh, strong connections with Northwest London. He's not Jewish, but he has uh, obviously the background of being an immigrant or coming from immigrant stock himself. Um, my aim this evening is to try and answer some of the doubts that a lot of Jewish people have about UKIP. I myself am Jewish and several people on my committee are Jewish. And we have people who are Muslims, we have people who are Christians, uh, we have people who are gay and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of misrepresentation about UKIP that's put out by the other parties and by the popular press. So I hope this evening to try and answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Daniel. Thank you. Well, good evening and thank you for inviting me. I'm Dan Thomas. I'm the Conservative candidate for uh, Barnet and Camden. And Barnet and Camden means a lot to me because it's where I've lived for most of my adult life. It's where I got my first proper job. It's where I managed to get onto the property ladder and it's where I've met my wife. Um, it's also where I've been involved in politics for the last 10 years as a councillor. And as a councillor, I've helped various community groups, faith groups and individuals um, achieve their goals and overcome problems. I've held positions of real responsibility in local government. I've overseen budgets and I've had to make difficult decisions to balance the books. I've achieved a lot for residents at the Town Hall and now I'd like to do the same at City Hall. And Conservatives have a strong track record in London. The last eight years have seen an overall reduction in crime, record investment in the transport system, and 100,000 new affordable homes built during a period of recession, and that's 15,000 more than under Ken Livingstone. All this has been achieved at the same time as reducing City Hall's share of council tax. 
Now, a lot has been achieved, but there's still more to do. There is always more to do in politics. But as your Assembly member, I want to see London's success be shared by Barnet and Camden. I want the planned upgrades to the Northern Line and Jubilee Lines to happen sooner rather than later. I want surplus public brownfield land in Barnet and Camden to be made available for homes and schools. And I want residents of all faiths and none to feel safe wherever they are. Now, I believe these ambitions can only be achieved by having a Conservative Assembly member working with a Conservative Mayor who in turn is working with a Conservative Government. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. I always find it interesting how um, opening remarks you expect to be quite homogenous, and actually they've all come in a different, with a different approach. Um, so first of all, thank you, candidates. And um, I'll start off, we had only a very few questions to begin with, so I'll start off with one question, um, and then hopefully we'll launch into others, and um, I really am going to encourage you to try to be as interactive as possible, and the panel to be as responsive as possible. So um, the first question is, is more specific about approach as opposed to vision, um, and that is how would you tackle the rise in anti-Semitism in London and hate crime in London? So um, we'll start. I think we'll start with Zach. Fantastic. Um, I think there needs to be a, a two-part approach. The first part is pretty obvious, which is we need more police officers on the streets. So we'll look at the prevention uh, moment in a second, but I think we also need to, to actually do something about hate crime. Those police, police officers need to be specifically trained in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, because at the moment they're pretty good with uh, homophobic crime, but I think when it comes to religion or, or uh, uh, things of ethnicity, the police are struggling, so I think they need better training. Caroline Pigeon, who's the uh, mayoral candidate for the Liberal Democrats, has pledged 3,000 extra police officers on the tubes, the trains, and the buses. We're going to pay for that because that's in the transport budget, so we can do things like scrap the Garden Bridge project, which is a vanity project, and use that for more police officers instead, which I think we can all agree would probably be a lot more useful. In terms of the other aspect, which is more prevention, we need to look at creating a more inclusive society. We need to be more spirited about things. I think the, uh, the voluntary, uh, voluntary security network that uh, the Jewish um, faith has that set up the, Islam uh, the, sorry, <laughs> the Islamic network, Tel Mama, is also a good step in the right direction. So we need to be looking at interfaith ideas of ways of protecting, of protecting our community. Okay, Andrew? Well, I, I think it's very sad that in Barna we've seen a, a 38% rise in faith aid crime, and in Camden nearly 16% rise over the last year. And I think it's important to recognise that we do have offences of racially aggravated violence and race harassment, indeed offences which I lobbied for and persuaded the government to adopt when I was in Parliament. I think part of the problem is to ensure we have a zero tolerance approach. That first of all means having sufficient police officers on the streets. When I was MP for Hendon, we had nine officers and PCSOs for every ward in Hendon and six in Camden. Now we only have two. And that is a result of the cuts in the police service that the sort of Conservatives have brought around. And there's another £400 million worth of the cuts to come, on top of the £600 million they've cut already. I think we have to recognise that zero tolerance isn't just about things that are, are obvious, insulting people on the bus and so forth. I think it's appalling that the coroner of North London wasn't prepared to put herself out to make sure that Jewish people could have their funerals within 24 hours, uh, as required by the faith. I think it means standing up alongside the CST and Shomri in their efforts to defend the Jewish community when these incidents happen. I think it means also tackling things like Israeli Apartheid Week, which we saw pretty appalling on the campuses, and it means working with the student unions and the universities to show zero, zero tolerance on campus. But I also think it means that when we see things happening like uh, fly posting on TfL, that we take immediate action about that, and indeed. Not only did I report the incidents to TfL to make sure they were dealt with, but I've also had a leak which I reported to the police of the people who were responsible. So I hope that they will now take action against them. But I think one of the real problems is the Met still doesn't actually understand what zero tolerance means. I've cross-examined the Metropolitan Police Commission about this on several occasions on the police committee, and they still don't get it. So I think we do need to do a lot more education of the police, and elsewhere as well, to make sure people actually understand what anti-Semitism means in the modern world. And as far as the Israel Apartheid Week is concerned, I think the mayor could easily organise, at the same time, as, as a, a conference at City Hall, 
to promote Israeli investment into the UK and vice versa. I think that's the best answer to BBS. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think it's a three-strand approach for me. First of all, education and awareness is important because it's quite easy to demonise people when you don't interact with them. And I think for that reason, um, schools of faith and, and, and secular schools as well um, should, should, should have a system where, whereby they, they cooperate with each other. Now, that, must, that interaction has to be handled by the schools. It shouldn't be enforced on them. But I think the more mixing of children there is between schools, um, the better. And I think that will foster uh, uh, tolerance as well. Um, I was honoured in uh, to sign up Barnet Council to the first multi-faith forum in London, and that is a forum, uh, forum of all religions that come together and work on issues such as anti-Semitism and hate crimes, but also other things as well, and help, helping each other out. And I was pleased to see in, in Barnet when the um, Somali Bravanese Centre was burnt down, Barnet Council helped facilitate uh, not only the rebuilding of the centre, but also other religious groups as well, um, taking in the Somali Bravanese uh, for, for, and, and borrowing premises and things like that. So it's a very cohesive environment, we need to see that continue. I think reporting of incidents, and, and, and whilst crime has gone up, I think it has, it is to do with, with reporting some of it as well. I think that's a good thing, and I think it shows that actually the account awareness campaign is getting out there, but we do need um, organisations, and I know the um, Community Security Trust do an excellent job in supporting uh, the community and, and people are reporting. Sometimes people are, are not comfortable reporting matters to the police, and third party facilitation, I think, um, really does help. And to say to people, actually, this is a crime, you do need to report it. And finally, uh, well, actually, my penultimate point that, that I think we do need a zero tolerance approach. Um, and, and I was pleased to hear that last year uh, a lady, uh, sorry, a gentleman got jailed for anti-Semitic comments he made on a bus. Um, and it just shows actually the police, when they've got evidence, when they've got witnesses, they do prosecute. And I would also say that as a politician, if, if I was representing uh, an area which had the largest Jewish population in the country, that if there was any anti-Semitic uh, shenanigans going on in my party, I would publicly condemn those people and I would force, yeah. I would force yeah. to leave yeah. to stop their indifference and to, and to speak out against it. Thank you, Daniel. Can I just remind the candidates to please stick to about 90 seconds for replies so we can include as many questions as possible. John? Yes, um, some of the things I wanted to say have already been said. Obviously, we need more police. Um, it is important in political parties that they do weed out anti-Semitism. And I'm really concerned about the growth in the Labour Party of um, anti-Semitic tweets and so on. And I think since Jeremy Corbyn has come to power, a lot of people feel that they have a license to say things that previously they would not have said. Um, UKIP has had a few bad apples, I must say, along with the Conservatives and the other parties, but we've always weeded them out. Um, anybody who's a BNP member is automatically excluded, and we're the only party that do that. Um, and previously, when we have had problems, and there was one uh, in December, uh, when somebody made very anti-Semitic remarks, uh, he was immediately excluded and has now been completely kicked out of UKIP. Uh, some of you will probably know what I'm talking about because it featured in the Jewish Chronicle. Um, as far as um, the other points <coughs> relating to this concern, I think we need far more mixing of the communities, um, but on the other hand, we also need to limit the number of people that are coming into the country, many of whom have very strong anti-Semitic views, people from Eastern Europe and people from the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, we're caught in the middle of these two groups, both of whom unfortunately share this one trait. Thank you. I love showing visitors from particularly Manhattan around London when they come to visit, because they're always so astonished by what a well-integrated society we have here. Uh, people of all different races and colours living together. They say, we thought New York was an international city. It's got nothing on London. And I'm proud to be a resident of London. We need to build on that, and we need to resist the pressures which are driving anti-Semitism here. So my fellows here on the, on the panel have spoken about practical measures which we should take, we could take, we must take. We just also remember that there's a pattern at work here. <clears throat> the 1930s, I seem to be back in history again, saw a huge rise in anti-Semitism and fascism 
here in Britain. And the pattern is that when people get pressed down and ground down, they start looking for enemies and scapegoats. And I would I invite you to consider this is the pattern produced by austerity. I believe it's Jewish teaching that when you harvest a field, you leave the corners for the birds and the animals. And there's a measure of economic justice in Voltaire. We should not squeeze too hard. Think about it. I wonder if you were able, it's just like the sort of Pepsi challenge, you know, if you were able to sort of blindfold everybody and not know who they were, would you be able to tell which candidate they were based on what they've said. Okay, <laughs> just a little idea. Um, can we have maybe a few questions from the audience or some reaction? Yes, could you stand up and say your name, please, and where you're from? Uh, my name's Joel Roberts. I'm from Chipping Barnet. Thank you. No need to shout, the, the microphone works. That's okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, my name's Joel Roberts. I'm from Chipping Barnet. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Dismal, which is, uh, why should the Jewish community trust him as a representative of the Labour Party to represent us? in the wake of quite literally countless acts of anti-Semitism in his party. Okay, I'm uh, sorry, I'm just going to stop you. I'm going to ask you please to rephrase your question, so it's open to all the candidates, mm -hmm. so we don't have one question directed at a specific candidate, okay. so you can rephrase it. Um, <coughs> and speak more clearly, please. Okay, I will try, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I guess then, to all the candidates, um, so uh, how would you defend your party's record on tackling anti-Semitism, and why does the Jewish community trust you to represent us? Um, I believe the question was. Yeah, could you just say it again? Yeah. Uh, it's better without the microphone, I think. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely. Uh, how would you defend your party's record on tackling anti-Semitism, and why should the Jewish community trust your party to represent us at the New City? Okay. With your permission, I'm just going to edit the question because I think that they've addressed the first half. The second <coughs> half is very interesting. The second half of your question is very interesting. What was that? <laughs> okay. How would you defend the record of your party on its approach to anti-Semitism in London? Okay. Would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Okay, again, just 90 seconds. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, well, I referred to this article in the Jewish Chronicle. Uh, we had uh, a chap who was the um, London regional chairman, so fairly high up, a chap called Hellings, who I think whilst under the influence of drink in a bar made a very, very anti-Semitic remark to Nigel Sussman, who's the chairman of one of our branches, he was immediately excluded and made to stand down. And I say immediately, I'm talking about within a day. Um, now there's not many of the other parties that act that quickly, so I'm very proud of the fact that we did respond immediately. It was unfortunate that he was in our party, he actually came originally from the Labour Party, but uh, we, won't, we won't go into that. Um, Not going to disparage. Yeah, no. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, would any of the candidates like to respond? Yeah. Go ahead, I'm, I'm a massive advocate of free speech. Um, so questions like this always make me slow down. Having said that, free speech absolutely comes with a responsibility. And as soon as you cross that line to anti-Semitism or racism, it cannot be tolerated. With that, I'd encourage political parties to have independent bodies, so when an instance like this happens, someone decides who isn't a party member, or who isn't involved with the higher echelons of the party, to have a look at what exactly is going on, and then discipline people accordingly. Okay. Anybody else would like to respond to that? Yeah. It's about defending your party's record on its approach to anti-Semitism in London. Yeah, absolutely. If you go onto the web and look at the webcast of my party's spring conference in Harrogate, you'll see an example of our standard procedures in operation. Every delegate at the conference gets a yellow card, which he or she is to raise if there's an issue which excludes anybody for being Jewish, for being homosexual, for being Muslim, whatever it is. And if you watch the webcast of the conference, you will see from time to time those yellow cards go up. Our record on exclusion is unvigilant. Okay. 
Um, on, on, on a local level, uh, in, in terms of uh, anti-Semitism, and I can honestly say this, there is no problem with anti-Semitism in the Conservative Party. From the, from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, there is no problem. I've not experienced it, I've not seen it, and, and certainly is not anywhere near um, the problem that is in, in, in the Labour Party. Um, we have a very strong Conservative Friends of Israel, uh, and, and the group there in, in and I know you can't, shouldn't confuse the two, but at, at conference it is the best attended reception there, and our Jewish members are made to feel very welcome. We have lots of Jewish councillors in Barnet, where I'm a councillor, and as I say, coming back, reading back from the anti-Semitism, but looking at all um, uh, uh, hate crime, um, as I say, Barnet Council, led by the Conservatives, was the first council in London to sign up to a multi-faith forum um, to, to foster cohesion amongst the communities. We very passionately believe in that, and there will be no place for any anti-Semites anti anti in the Conservative Party, and they will be very, very quickly slapped down by politicians <coughs> of all levels in the party. I'd say to that is what about Alan Duncan who had some rather peculiar remarks to say not so very long ago and I'm against the action has been taken as civil liberal democrats. Any party that says there is no problem whatsoever is 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 illegally inclined cooking lamp. But the, the yeah. question the question is about the Labour Party <coughs> and there is a problem. Uh, it's not, as I saw in the Jewish Chronicle, a tidal wave of hate or something. It is a relatively small number compared to hundreds of thousands of people who are members of the Labour Party. <coughs> But it is shaming to us, it is distressing to the 99% plus of members who re repudiate entirely such views. And it's for those of us who are not Jewish to create the kind of party where anti-Semitism is not welcome and is clearly stamped out. People, I think the question is how can they trust me? Well, I think my record over the best part of 20 years representing the community speaks for itself in that respect. Uh, action is being taken. To my mind, we were very slow off the mark when we had that huge influx of new members uh, last year, and I think a lot of the people we're concerned about came in last year, but only last week, if you read the Ham and High, you'll see we excluded somebody in Camden, uh, as council has just been suspended in Kensington, uh, and uh, somebody around the rest of the country. I think part of the problem is that we have a, a constitution we have to comply with, and the disciplinary procedures are somewhat slower than we would all like, but if we tried to chuck people out without following the correct procedures, they'd take us to court, we'd lose, and they'd be in even stronger position, which is clearly where we want to be. So, I think there are things we need to do. Uh, I think we need to make sure the NEC is trained in modern anti-Semitism and unconscious bias. I think we need a vice chair of the NEC Equalities Committee in the Labour Party, specifically for the Jewish community. I think we have to have a lot more resources in our compliance unit to deal with these sort of complaints to make sure they're processed much more efficiently. I think we also need to clarify our rules to make it absolutely clear that any anti-Semitism will result in a lifetime ban from the party. I think we need to have third party reporting. I think we need to have an independent ombudsperson to deal with any complaints where people think we've not dealt with the complaint properly. I think we need to have groups for Jewish youth and student members organising on their own within universities, within labour clubs, so they don't face the problems that we saw in Oxford, which are being examined and inquired into <coughs> by John, John Ryan, and I think everybody has good confidence in. I think we need a modern understanding of anti-Semitism. Victims do matter, so when uh, uh, insults like Zaya slung around, uh, there seem to be insults that are absolutely unacceptable compared to a proper informed debate about issues relating to Israel. And I think now that the Jewish Labour Movement has extended its membership to non-Jews, um, those of us non-Jews, and I should be doing the same, should be joining to express our solidarity with the Jewish members of our Labour Party, uh, who are numerous, who are active, and who occasionally need support, but I think they're doing a pretty good job setting up themselves within the party now to make sure this problem is tackled. Thank you. I, I, from this perspective, I can tell you I would never encourage mental fist fights, but um, the passion is palpable, okay, <laughs> in terms of that issue. Um, if you take a look at the London Jewish Manifesto, um, which you should have a copy of, there are a number of issues, and if we've already raised a question about one specific one, we wouldn't want to exhaust it. So if you've got a question either about housing or social care or education or other than that, I would encourage you. Are there any <coughs> questions? Yes. Yes. Just bring your microphone. Thank you. Just please stand up. Say your name and where you're from, please. Yeah, my name's Debbie Katari, and I live in West Hampstead. In fact, I'm down the road. A lot of people have been affected by bedroom tax here in London. How would the candidates work with our mayoral candidates to try and make sure that there is enough affordable housing in London 
so that people that are affected by it don't necessarily have to move out. Everybody had a question? She asked about housing to expand and develop that to make sure that everybody has a good vision. I'm just paraphrasing. Yeah. It's UKIP's policy, I'm just checking on it so I don't just quote it, uh, to protect the green belt, to bring back empty homes into use, to build a million homes on brownfield sites by 2020, and to prioritise social housing for those with... But we absolutely have a crisis on our hands. We need to build houses and we need to build them fast. There's enough brownfield sites in, um, in London that if you put all of TfL's land together, you would have land the size of Camden. There is enough land to build and we are not full at all. With those housing, we need to get rid of this term affordable housing. It's not affordable for people. 80% of market rate is not affordable. So what we need to be doing, what we need to be doing is building council housing. And we need to not shy away from that term as if it's become some dirty phrase. We need to build at least 50,000 council houses. On top of that, the other 150,000 that we're pledging to build are going to be mixes of private and shared ownership. How are we going to afford this? When 2012, with the council tax, there was something called the Olympic precept. That means you're paying £20 extra a year for council tax. Rather than Labour and the Tories who want to withdraw that, we'd keep that. We think we need an Olympic effort to build housing. That would raise £2 billion that we can invest and give people the homes we so desperately need. Do you feel that there is a stigma attached to council housing? What you say it doesn't sound like that. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a stigma towards it. I think generally in society, some of the council housing was built really badly. Um, both Labour councils and Tory councils have started what we call regeneration projects, which basically means they decimate the social housing that's there and then build an affordable housing in, in big tower blocks. So I think when we regenerate things, we need to regenerate them carefully and we need to have more thought about how can we build a cohesive society. It comes back a little bit to the anti-Semitic question. How do you start looking at not multiculturalism, but interculturalism? <coughs> So rather than having different ghettos of different religions across London, we start to look at how can we be even more cohesive and learn from each other. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, your question also is specifically about the fact that you live in West Hampstead. Um, so talking about the green belt is interesting, but I think you're more specifically talking about this particular area and certainly the constituency of this evening. So if we can address that, that would be great. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, you need to uh, increase supply. Um, it is not enough supply uh, for both rental and um, homes to buy, and it's only going to the prices will only stabilise or even drop if you increase supply. That's the simple um, law of supply and demand. And to increase supply, you need a decent strategy. Um, and in Barnet Council in 2010, we set out on a 15-year housing strategy. Unfortunately, Camden in 2011 set out on a five-year strategy. Um, you also um, increase supply by having realistic targets for developers. Councils who promise 50% affordable homes, that's half of and, and, and when we call it affordable, I think we should also agree that we're calling it subsidised. That subsidy either comes from the taxpayer or it comes from the developer. So we're asking for 50% affordable homes, or I'm not, the same um, uh, boroughs like Camden are. No borough has achieved that, and I know Sadiq Khan is calling for it. He won't achieve it, and, and, and Camden won't achieve it. Indeed, in 2014, um, Camden promised um, 6,000 new homes, half of which would, would be affordable, and actually they're on target to reach um, about 300 odd affordable homes by the end of the term. So it will, developers just walk away. Now, why do we need developers? Because the council has not got billions of pounds to build these homes and that's what it needs so developers will walk away you do need to have a good relationship with them and in Barnet we've set a target of 40 percent um, for affordable housing and, and indeed we've actually achieved that um, since 2010 39 percent affordable housing and we can't just talk about council housing and, and, and social rented we in Barnet as well we know that people want to aspire to own their own home so the proportion of affordable housing should also be for ownership some sort of shared ownership as well, where people can buy as little as 25% of the property, and as their salary increases over time, they can start to um, uh, uh, buy more equity. So 
you need to increase supply, you need to be able to have a good relationship with, with the uh, developers, and you need to set realistic targets, uh, and you also uh, need, to, need a, a good mi mixture. We don't want to trap people in renting, we need to get them uh, to buy as well. And Barnet, and I know um, Andrew's going to say that apparently we've got rid of 800 um, social homes for rent, and actually we've built uh, around about 950 since, since 2011, which have replaced that. We've also got a target to, uh, and we will hit it, of up to 800 council homes over the next five years as well. So you do need a sort of multifaceted strategy, and you need to have it realistic. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, before you reply, I'd just like to make one comment. Um, whilst this, we are very interested in general issues to do with the uh, housing in London um, and Greater London, uh, this is a London Jewish Forum event, and therefore it would be very useful also, if Andrew, you could tie some of your remarks to the social cohesion within the concept of housing. Um, specifically geared toward the Jewish community, gentrification, I'm just giving you ideas, but you can take it from there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I've got to answer the points that, that, uh, that, that uh, Daniel made. I mean, this is a tale of two boroughs in Barnet and Camden, and the numbers speak themselves. Uh, net new homes, percentage of London plan target 2014-15. Net new homes, Barnet 1207, Camden 1541. Percent of London plan target, Barnet 55%, Camden 232%. Affordable housing is percentage of all new homes 2012-2015, Barnet 28%, Camden 36%. If anybody really knows what wants to know what's happening in, in, in Barnet, look at the film about West Hendon that was shown on the BBC three weeks ago. Dan Thomas thinks he was somehow biased, but when I see him laughing on that film in the face of residents who are there to stand up for themselves at a council meeting, I think that was pretty appalling. And if you want to see what can be done, this is what Camden did. Go and visit Backton Low Rise in Camden, where they worked with the tenants. The tenants are being rehoused in decent homes without any of the problems that we've seen on West Hendon with people being shipped all over London, with uh, people that left in temporary accommodation for years on end with no opportunities to put down proper routes. And yes, we are going to have a net loss of 800 social homes as a result of all this. And the question raised, I think, the question of the bedroom tax. This is down the government. It's not just the bedroom tax, it's the benefit cap, it's the pay to stay, which is going through Parliament now, which will make it difficult for people to stay in social homes, and it's also the appalling use of temporary tendencies, which I've, I've mentioned earlier on. So yes, we do need to increase housing supply. We need to make sure that when we increase housing supply, we do so in such a way that makes new homes for Londoners, not for overseas uh, speculators and investors. The biggest problem we've got is sales off plan in, in Singapore, Malaysia and Hong Kong, where people buy a home two years ahead, never intend to live in it or even see it, as an investment. And a Londoner can't compete in that market because you can't pay for your existing housing as well as the money you need to provide up front to buy off plan. So it's a rigged market before you even start if you're looking at home purchase. We also have to look at the way people rent and make sure that we do have social homes and the new art concept that Sadiq has of, uh, of a London living rent uh, equivalent to a third of, of, of the average income in an area. These are all important developments and what's especially important I think is that we reflect on the fact that we don't want to have, I think you mentioned the point, segregated housing where we have the poor door with one block all for poor people which is obviously so and where everything isn't built quite to the high standard that the private sector has built homes have, and we see this in the estate where, where Dan's just bought a new house in Stonegrove. Go and teach Peter residents on Lindy's farm, just down the road from you, and see what they think of the homes that they've been given instead of the ones they had on Stonegrove before you knocked it down. Um, you'll find that they are very concerned about the quality of the build there. I get complaints all the time. I think it's also making sure we have homes of the right size, particularly for uh, people who are in larger families, which I, I think is the case for uh, a number of the larger uh, acidic uh, community, uh, particularly uh, in parts of the East End. So there are a lot of things we need to do. And to do that, we, ha we do have to have a, di a proper uh, a target for affordable homes. Yes, 50% is a target. It doesn't mean to say you're necessarily going to reach it. If you don't reach for it, you're never going to get anywhere near it. 
that I think is the starting point I say that. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Dan, you'd like to reply to that? Thank you, um, Chairman. There were two uh, questions that the uh, well, comments. So first, first of all, this accusation that I was laughing at some resident. It is, it is yeah. pathetic. The, 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 at that council meeting, the resident concern made, made actually a very humorous speech on a serious subject, and, and people and councillors all across the chamber were laughing, and she was using little, little um, uh, 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 Miniature dire, uh, models, and, and it was quite, it was, it was quite funny actually, and, and and it was done in good humour, although it was a serious subject. And that documentary cut cut to me laughing at that with, with 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 colleagues as well, and and they cut out bits of my speech as well, where I explained in West Hendon that although there has been a decrease in social rented homes, if you add on the affordable homes to buy, there has been a 16% increase on those um, units. Uh, affordable units overall. So actually, they, they, they distorted the figures, they cut my speech short, they showed a picture of me laughing. What they also excluded was an hour-long uh, session where I took them around Stone Grove and I showed them the new community centre, the new church, the new, the new flats, which are indistinguishable. The private flats, indistinguishable to the social rented flats, actually. They are indistinguishable, and I've been in there. They, they cut out the section where the two ladies were very happy with their flats. So, so when we talk about documentaries, you can tell a certain story in a certain way. And I was, I was involved in that, in, that, in that, and they didn't even use my, my footage, which is fine, that's up to them. And then lastly about Stone Grove, yes I have bought a house on a regeneration scheme and I'm proud that, the, that when I bought, purchased my private house that the proceeds from that help subsidise and build yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, new yeah, yeah, yeah. social housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buying those private homes, the social housing would not have been rebuilt, and the social housing we replaced was concrete. It was it was brutalist. It was um, falling down. Uh, it was expensive to heat. Leaseholder costs were going through the roof, and and therefore they had to be rebuilt. And then it's through private development that it has been rebuilt. And and and, and the block of flats that the, the social tenants are living in now, you can live in them with pride, and there is no stigma about living in social housing on these estates. Very, very brief one. The cheapest advertised property available on the West End of the state costs £471,500. That ignores the shared ownership. And more than 12 times the local median household income of £38,000, with help to buy a family median income of more than £70,000 to afford this property. That's London. And even That's under London. the even under the even under the so-called affordable housing definition of the Conservative <coughs> Party, 80% of market rent and 80% of sale price is not affordable. Yes, and um, just while these two have a little Labour Tory ding dong that we're all very used to. Um, Dan mentioned the phrase about being trapped in renting, and I just want to put him up slightly on that phrase. I'm someone who rents and I'm happy to rent. I don't think that people should feel like they need to rent because the housing market is so ridiculously expensive. The problem for me is this I've lived in Camden 10 times and I've had to move house six times. That's because after six months of contract, a landlord can say, I'm putting the rent up or you have to move out. I think we need more secure renting for people. Yes. With that, we need longer term tenancies capped at the rate of inflation, an end to revenge or retaliation evictions, and also we need to make sure that we have a mandatory register of landlords so we know exactly who we're renting from. Wow, that's exciting. That's a very good platform. Yes, can you please stand up and say your name and where you're from? Certainly. So, uh, Rahul Badsali uh, from West Hampstead. So, I'm really interested in hearing the panel's opinion on ensuring local views are heard on planning decisions. In West Hampstead, we have a fantastic neighbourhood development forum that was ratified in the referendum last summer, but really dismayed that the Labour-run Camden Council are no longer, have just ruled that they're no longer going to be sending out letters to local residents when they're planning going to be happening right next door to them really interesting what people want to say and maybe expand it to the point of view around <coughs> general localism and how we're going to hear a voice back into City Hall. Okay. I'm very happy to take that question and that will be the last one on housing and then I'm happy to take up questions on other issues. Thank you all. Um, would we like to respond? Yes, um, so as a Liberal Democrat it won't surprise you to know that I'm very pro-localism. Keith Moffat, who was the leader of Camden Council when it was a Liberal Democrat-led council, was instrumental in leading that referendum and knocking on doors and, and getting that passed. No, I, I think it's clear that we need to make sure... No, it wasn't. I think... <laughs> for records there, sir. I think it's clear that we need to make sure that we're really listening to communities. And I don't mean that in a way it's just uh, kind of vaguely hearing what people's opinions are and then putting them on the back of a leaflet. I mean regularly knocking on people's doors and making sure we're actively going to people. And not just knocking on people's doors. I think we actually need to go into communities. 
So if we look at the Jewish community, for instance, I think we need our politicians to be embedded within that community so they really understand what the needs of people are. I think localism has to be the way forward, community has to be the way forward, not just for the Jewish community, but all our different communities across London. Anybody else like to respond to that? Yeah, um, okay. Um, yes, the Neighbourhood Development Forum is very good, very effective, and I'm in communication with them already about a number of issues, most recently the question of the tube station and the need for step-free access, and I'm very pleased that Philippe <coughs> Carlin has indicated that one of the things he will do is require TfL to review that whole uh, project to see if it can be made to happen. Uh, as far as planning is concerned, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure the point about letters from Camden, but I think that they are mainly using, e using, using email now. Yeah. But I can tell you, it doesn't really work very well in Barnet either. In Edgware, there's a, a, an application in for a 17-storey tower block next to the tube station, and Barnet's planning department consulted by letter only within 150 yards of the 17-storey tower block, although it will be seen for miles away. Uh, and will have a huge impact on the local community for the whole ward, if not uh, also into uh, <laughs> across the boundary into Harrow, uh, and will also have a huge impact on the shops in the area. So it, 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 it is a problem how you communicate, and I think we as politicians have got the responsibility to make sure that happens. And, yeah. and what the we actually one, do instead I'm, of I'm the opposite side. In, in relation to the Edgware one, for example, I've got a, quite a large mailing list of people in Edgware myself, and I emailed out everybody and told them what was going on and organise for people to put project objectives if they want to. And indeed, I often, uh, probably too often, end up appearing at planning committees uh, in Barnet, um, making objections which are always overruled by the planning committee, except one where we're both on the same side, which was a, a record. Um, but generally speaking, I'm afraid Barnet Council take no notice whatsoever of residents' no obje <laughs> objections. No so uh, I, th I think part of the problem is the way this government has also changed planning law to make it harder to object. Uh, in that the presumption is now in favour of development, which makes it much harder to actually turn things over when they should be turned over. And, and the permitted development rights, which they brought in, are going to be absolute, are already quite creating great devastation. They're going to make things even worse, because office blocks like in, in, we've seen in Edgware uh, and elsewhere in Camden as well could be converted into housing without the need for planning permission and with no affordable housing requirement whatsoever either. And I think the government's decision to introduce these permitted development rights is appalling. It has a huge impact on our economy because it means that office blocks, uh, light industrial and so on can all be converted with a huge loss of jobs, huge impact on the local economy and no save the planning authority whatsoever. And indeed, I think Barnett might even have turned it down, um, judging by the comments I received from the Environmental Health Department, have they had the power to do so? To answer your question specifically, I think I think we should uh, continue to write to neighbours about planning applications because how else will you know? Um, and if you don't, these days people don't always talk to their neighbours, so they might they, they might not be friends. Who knows? But I, I think we should write to people. We can't rely on emails. Not we, the council doesn't have the email address of every resident, um, and nor should it. But um, I, I think we should keep those letters. And in terms of, of consulting with people, the, the tower block in Edgeware that's proposed, um, it is proposed to be right next to another tower block that's been there since the 1960s or 70s. I would actually see that tower block. Um, I, I live in Edgeware, and actually, do you know what? I'm not going to oppose everything. Developed. I would be in favour of that particular uh, planning application because it will bring homes to the area. It will bring a, a, a money to the area. This, the, the, the part of Edgeware town um, where the block would be, it's a very Jewish area around there, and people would not know this, this is, this is what I call the kosher end, which is very nice, and then there's another end near the high street, unfortunately, that isn't so nice, and I think this, this particular development would, would step that the other side of Edgeware high street up, it would bring it back up to the standard of the other side. Um, the developers, by any so, chance, essential living, the same developers yes. who I, are behind 100 Avenue Road and I, I don't Archway, know. And I don't know who they are, by an American no. investment company okay. who is nameless, and um, I've tried to find out something I, I, about I, them, and it's been question. impossible. We okay, so I, I don't, I don't know who, who the who the, who, the, who the development firm is. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, but uh, it is it is a very good scheme. Um, I have concerns about the heights um, because it's, it's a thin tower. It is, it, they are allowed apparently to be higher. Um, I think it should be a bit shorter than the existing block next door. Um, but ultimately, we need homes, and if we're going to keep saying no to all these schemes, um, and they need to be sensitive, they can't be too high. We keep saying no all the time. Nothing will get built. Prices will go up, uh, and, and, and we'll just be where we are now with the problem. So we do need to say yes.
the responsible development and we need to let neighbours know when something's being built. Thank you, well, I'll tell you how it works in my street. We've got an email list of about 200 addresses in the street. We had an application go in the last few days for some changes to the pub, uh, which um, were based on some full submissions that those got pounced on and discussed in the, in the street email group. And... Um, I believe a planning office is going around to see them early next week. So what am I saying here? You can't beat neighbourhood relationships. You've got to build them. Can I say? John, please. Yeah. Um, Daniel, I think, said something about supply and demand. Um, when we come to talk about housing, it always seems to be that we talk about supplying more and more houses. And obviously there's going to come a point where we cannot go on with the supply side, so we have to address the demand. And the only way we can address the demand is to cut down the number of people who require these houses. Now as long as we're bringing 300,000 extra people in a year, we are never ever going to catch up. I've recently uh, visited Collingdale, well I've visited it more or less all the time, but the way that area has changed, um, I live in Hendon, I drive down Aerodrome Road, first you've got Beaufort Park, um, then there's the Graham Park Estate that's being increased, then there's about a dozen blocks, or more, well, in fact more, probably about 20 blocks being built around the station, including an enormous ugly thing behind Collingdale Station, but they've done nothing at all about the roads, nothing at all about the tube, and you just cannot go on cramming more and more people into a given amount of space. And when um, one of the, I think it was the gentleman at the end, said we've got plenty of brownfield sites, that may be true. But the point is that we haven't got the infrastructure. London is grinding to a halt. We haven't got the number of places in the hospitals, we haven't got the transport. People who actually live and have to catch public transport will tell you what a nightmare it is every day to be pushed in like cattle into trucks and it's only going to get worse until we leave the EU and we can put a stop to unlimited immigration. Thank you. Uh, yes, stand up and say your name please, and where you're from. Will you use your position on the GLA um, and, and with your sort of role in the GLA, will you use that to promote the London living wage? Okay. Sorry, thank Ben Samuel from Hendon. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, we'll take Ben's question. And again, if we can really refocus the questions on, as, as well as general issues about London, also the issues of the Jewish constituents of London as we are the London Jewish Forum event. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, um, uh, Barnet Council very recently adopted a London living wage. We very much believe in, in that, and I think we should have, have fair pay. If we keep our key workers, we need to pay them property, properly. And the other thing we need to do as well on, on this topic is um, local authority rent increases. And since 2011 12, Barnet has only increased it by £3 per week. And unfortunately, in Canada, it's gone up by £12 per week and all the neighbouring boroughs as well. So we, it's not just about the, um, the, the living wage, it's also about the rents as well, so we need, we need to make sure that we control control both. Are you barely employing anyone? Please, don't shout out what's happened to take um, You've outsourced it all and their salaries have gone down. Yeah. But is it good for the job? Okay. Down. Yes, please. Is it coming at the end of every question, right? Okay. Okay. Um, Yes, I would absolutely support it. I think you know, if, if people uh, work hard, they deserve to be paid for it. I think it's important to point out that it's not actually something the Assembly can do. I heard your question was, would you, would you lobby for it? So the, the Assembly has financial muscle. It has what we call soft power. So it has a microphone in front of it. It has journalists. So I'd certainly push for that on the Assembly. The Assembly's role is actually just to hold the Mayor accountable. So there's the Mayor and 25 Assembly members, and they hold the Mayor accountable for their budget and uh, several devolved issues. A living wage isn't a devolved issue, but it is something that I would absolutely push for. I think also um, to connect earlier what I was saying with renting as well, and um, this is a Jewish issue because actually 
if you're being moved around uh, home all the time, you're not necessarily near the local synagogue. So, and this is about a community. And of course, with that community, the community deserves to be paid for their money. So, yes, I would absolutely support the living wage. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I have been, and uh, the Labour Party has been, we've been continually exposing Boris Johnson's failure on failures on the London Living Wage. He's made various pledges that he would try and expand it, but in practice, the proportion of people on the London Living Wage has gone down compared to, to before. Uh, as far as Camden is concerned, uh, Camden does pay the London Living Wage. It's also implementing Unison's Ethical Care Charter which I think is very important for care workers so that it can't be avoided by this ridiculous way of people not being paid for travelling time and so forth. And Cameron's gone even further than that because uh, they publish their pay gap data, they have a minimum earnings guarantee, and they also make sure that their pay ratio between the, the least well-paid staff and the highest paid staff is no more than one in ten. So they've done quite a lot as well, I think, with uh, that Dover Party in Camden in trying to deal with the question of pay fairness. First, at first sight, the London living wage seems a very good idea, but it's actually very little more than was being paid before, and most responsible employers in London will probably be paying more than the London living wage. What it does do, however, is it sends out a message to people overseas who, in their own country, might be only earning a tenth or even a twentieth of the London living wage, uh, and it can only act as a magnet to bring more people here. So, you know, there may be unforeseen consequences, whilst it may sound very good, I think you have to look at it in the round. Well, it's a start. It's a start and it's not a bad start, but the elephant in the room here is house prices and the cost of accommodation, which is pumping the poorer people of London out into the periphery. Uh, and unless we, ad unless we address that and provide either a, a great deal more low price accommodation in London, then we're going to have to deal with the problems of excessive burden on our transport infrastructure, rent house renting and house prices going through the roof and the breakup of communities as uh, your own children and their children can't afford to live near you. What we need is a city that's run for its inhabitants, not for people who, um, who are selling property. Okay. Yeah, just a quick one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last week I was campaigning outside Belsize Park for the Stronger End campaign to remain in Europe. Um, incidentally, Israel's uh, exports are 35% of the EU, so there's strong, strong reasons for Israel as well for us to remain in Europe. Um, I was waving the flag around, as you do, the European Union flag, and my picture was put on Facebook. An old Jewish friend of mine who's a writer, Sam Borden Jacobs, wrote, good on you. And incidentally, behind you is an appropriate picture. Behind me was the flats in Belsize Park, which it was accidental, I didn't know, I admit, were built in the 1930s for refugees that were fleeing Germany, hyper-nationalistic uh, right-wing government, sound familiar? And I think, as a Jewish man, you should really know your history, because actually we're a country that have always welcomed Jewish refugees. We've always been open-hearted, we've been inclusive, and we've always welcomed people into London. And long may that continue. Uh, Jeremy. I will decline only because there's a few other pressing questions, please. You want, you yeah, yeah. If you can stand um, up, please, and say your name. Uh, my name's James Earl. It's a West Hampstead question. Um, I'd like to turn the topic to transport. One of the big issues that we face in this area is transport. Uh, I'm pleased to see in your manifesto um, improving public transport infrastructure is a vital part of well, all of London, but particularly for this area. Um, people travelling to great places like this and other places in West Hampstead. Just two things we're really focused on is campaigning for an upgrade of West Hampstead Tube Station. I've been in contact with some of you about that. I've got some plans I can show you afterwards as well. Would you commit to supporting that? And secondly, helping us deal with some of the chronic traffic problems we're, trying to, we're facing and air pollution on West End Lane and Finchley Road uh, right out the front here. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take another question as well, since we've dealt also with housing and transport specifically. It's very specific to West Hampstead, so as long as the candidates have sort of made a note of that, that question, thank you. I'll take a question up there. Uh, Miles Longfield from Finchley. Um, just speak slowly so we can hear you. It's a very easy question. I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. what the Lib Dem chap uh, said earlier, it's very important that people get to understand their community, um, so they have a good feel for it. And 
it's important that you live in the community and that you're supposed to be representing. So I just want to make sure all candidates live in Barnet and Camden. And if they don't live in Barnet and Camden, do they plan to move should they be elected? Okay. I think with respect, I'm going to take that question first because it's an easy one to answer. Do all the candidates live in Barnet and Camden? Yes. Yes. I have a place in Edgware and I have a place in, West, in, um, in uh, Westbourne Park, which is extremely convenient for Camden. Right. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, that's great. I'll take one more before we get to the local, local question. Yes. Um, Hello, my name is Stephen Wright, I live in Finchley. Uh, my question is about the BDS. Uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of councils we're aware of, I, I, I work um, actively to uh, deal with BDS and a number of other campaigns. Um, a number of councils across the country have said that they need support or will act for the BDS. Uh, recently, the government and the council and, uh, uh, councils have made uh, a provision not to do that. I'd like to ask the uh, panelists what they think about the BDS and would they support the BDS and their actions or would they uh, make sure the BDS wasn't supported? In Thank you very much for your question. Um, I'd just like to say to the gentleman from West Hampstead, I will allow the candidates to reply very briefly to the question, specifically as, as it is a specific question to the area and to you specifically. Um, and then I'd like to just focus the rest of the time if we can on your question, and then we can take one more. And again, I welcome you to look at the manifesto. There's issues of Jewish school, et cetera, uh, Jewish school places, and social care. Uh, so let's just start with answering the gentleman's question here about West Hampstead. Go ahead, briefly. Um, as you know, we've been in touch, so I absolutely support lift access at West Hampstead. I think there's a wider point there of people with disabilities being shafted um, con continuously in London and across the UK. Um, Myself and Andrew were at uh, uh, Hustings last week at uh, a learning disability centre called Dimensions. Sadly, the Conservatives didn't send a representative, you know, representative which I, I thought was, was pretty shameful. They hardly ever do. This is only the third time I've ever seen a Conservative on a Hustings in the last three years in relation to yeah, what elections in Parliament. Yeah, and this so it's all holiday. What have I said on? Indeed, passion. Um, and also we never show up. Um, with Zach Goldsmith uh, voting for disability benefits to be cut. I think there's, you know, a, a bigger, wider point there about accessibility. Um, with the traffic, there's 10,000 extra premature deaths um, a year in London based on air pollution. We're not hitting our carbon emissions targets. I live on the Euston Road, which is the second most polluted road in Europe. We absolutely need to do something about air pollution. One, one solution I have, although there's lots, is I'm a very keen cyclist. I think we really need to be promoting cycling. With that, though, safer cycling, I get that some people hate cyclists, and with good reason. I think we need to have segregated cycle lanes, so motorists are respected, pedestrians are respected, and cyclists are respected too. I'm a very safe cyclist, and I, uh, uh, um, I'm respectful of other people on the road, and I really think we need to encourage that culture so we can get more people on bikes. With that, a Liberal Democrat policy is also to give half-price tube fares before 7.30 in the morning. That would mean less rush hour and congestion on the roads and in the traffic, and would mean more people were on that. With that, we'd up the congestion charge a little bit for private hire vehicles because we just don't think there's people people need to be driving in central London at that time. Okay. Do you want me to answer BDS now? No, we'll do just okay. this. <laughs> okay. I just would like to be really brief on the West Hampstead question, if you can, and then move on to the BDS question, please. Okay. Anybody else on West uh, Well, I think I already said that uh, I have spoken to Sadiq and he has given a commitment that he will have the issue of the West Hampstead uh, step free access thing reviewed uh, if he wins the election to see if we can make that happen. Uh, as far as air pollution is concerned, well, it's partly down to Boris's new buses, which are still polluting. We didn't have to have those buses. Uh, personally, I would like to see the uh, ultra low emission zone extended beyond the, uh, the Euston Road boundary. Um, to coterminous areas, and Camden is very keen to extend the UBLEDs, uh, and I think that's important. Uh, I think on air pollution generally, uh, I think it's very important that we remain a member of the European Union because we can't tackle air pollution uh, as, a one uh, as a nation on our own. It's an international problem, it's tackling internationally. But as far as cycling is concerned, I wait for the question on CS11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just um, the lady from Barnet Green Party who called out about Conservatives not attending hustings. Well, this is the first one that I've been invited to, and this is this is I've come here. I'm not aware of of any other invites, and I would have been there. I would have been there had I been invited. Um, Congratulations! And, and you mentioned and and, and, and and you mentioned three years no Conservatives been to a hustings. Google. 
General Election 2015, Barnet Hustings, Matthew Offer did Hustings, Mike Freer did Hustings, yeah. and Theresa Villiers did Hustings. So I think we need to get your facts right. Anyway, transport. <laughs> transport. So um, we can't do any improvements uh, uh, over the next few years to the transport system if Sadiq's gone £1.9 billion pound hole isn't like this. His fare his fare freeze is going to cost. It's been confirmed by TfL 1.9 billion pound, and basically it's on a hymn and a prayer as to how he will plug that gap. Apparently, something to do with revenue streams, and he has ducked and dived every single time to give us a line by line budget as to how he would plug that gap. So I'm afraid any improvements, particularly in West End, uh, Hampstead, or anywhere else will not be funded. And what, what else will be at risk is the upgrade of the Jubilee and Northern Lines, um, which are due in the 2020s. I would like to have a date for those, and for those to be built, brought forward. Again, that would be uh, put at risk by, by that promise. So we, we do need um, uh, Zach Goldsmith in to make sure that there is no yeah. black hole. In yeah. the The West Hampstead question, chronic traffic, air pollution, these are all part of the same problem that we have with housing. As the city pumps its poor out to the periphery, the number of people having to commute is going up and is overloading our transport network. We've got specific proposals to improve the access for cycling, which will alleviate some of the, some of the space. But you need to see these problems as a whole and see that housing and transport are deeply connected. Thank you. John, do you have anything to say about the West Hampton question specifically? Well, it all comes down to numbers, and the more traffic on the road, the more congested it's going to be in West Hampton. It always has been congested, but it seems to be getting worse. And it's, until we reduce the number of people on the road, we're never going to solve the problem. Okay, um, the BDS question, one, one rebuttal, please. Um, can we just say that the, the BDS question will be the last question, um, as we're running out of time? I know, it just seems like a very short amount of time. Okay, okay, well, I mean, the Tories put this out about the fair freeze. Um, absolute nonsense. Uh, TfL's figure relates to five years, not four years, which is a mayoral term. They've used inflation figures which are way above what the, uh, what the government predict. Uh, they've not even published a business plan which says how they got to that figure and they haven't explained how it's calculated. So uh, I take that with a pinch of salt. Well, the, f the, fair free the fair freeze is an important yeah. uh, uh, initiative which will enable Londoners to travel to work at a rate that they can afford. It will also be funded uh, through free... I mean, how many people here know, for example, that a lot of the bus companies in London are actually run by companies that actually belong to the governments in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, 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 that, and the profits they make out of TfL are exported to those. So, you know, it's... No, it wasn't Labour, actually, for the Tories. Um, so we need to be able to compete in equal terms and bid for the transport systems in those, in those countries as well. So we can actually have a revenue stream like that in other cities around, around the country. Uh, there's a lot of waste with TfL, for example, there are separate engineering functions for the overground and the, the underground service. Procurement waste, a huge amount of money to, to, be, to be saved there. So uh, the fares freeze is affordable. Thank you. Um, the last question this evening is um, a very important issue of BBS. And um, this is the last question of the evening. I would like to open it up to the candidates. And again, just keep your remarks concise and brief, and I'm sure there might be some reaction from the audience. So if we can just contain the response and the rebuttal and the question, <laughs> I'd appreciate that. Okay, that's great. Um, anybody would like to start, Stephen? I don't have much to say on this. I've heard some of the arguments. Um, uh, I'd like to let it go ahead. You would like what go ahead? Um, Okay, so your board policy. So you support the BDS? Do you support it? Yes, yes or no? No, it's um, neutral. Do you know what it is? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
John? John Olson. Okay, John wants to pass. Okay. Um, I think Darren's about to speak. <laughs> it's a simple bit. I'm against BDS. Hey and simple. What? Hmm. Yeah. We can the question just to understand if it contributes or disrupts to the democracy in the Middle East. I think maybe that frames the concept of BDS in a more impacting way. Um, Okay, no, I'll, I'll comment on that because okay. um, I went to Israel a couple of years ago with Trade Union Friends of Israel. Um, and it was a very interesting visit because I was particularly, well, normally I'd go with, tra tra with Labour Friends of Israel, but on this occasion I wanted to do something different, to look at the economy, the economic issues, in, in particular reference to BDS. And when I came back, I actually went to see the Board of Deputies and some ideas I had from that visit about how we could actually come back with BDS campaign. And the interesting thing is I actually took an official from the Fire Brigade Union who are known to be pro-BDS. And when he came back, uh, he had a rather different view. Uh, and I think part of the problem is that people don't actually see what it actually means in Israel. Your so, for example, so for example, uh, I visited a factory in the West Bank where everybody worked together and you had Palestinians supervising Orthodox Jews and vice versa, depending on whether they were good or not. And talking to the Palestinian workers, um, although it's technically against the law for them to work in these factories, there's a long queue for any vacancies that occur because they're protected by Israeli labour laws and Israeli minimum wages, which is about three times what they earn as a Palestinian. And the, and the BDS doesn't actually work if you think about the, re the realities of it. For example, if you look at drugs, um, one of the drugs that is made, that's legal drugs of course, one of the drugs that is made uh, in, in, uh, in, in Israel is, the, is the, they have the monopoly, or, or patent rather, on the drug for multiple sclerosis. Well, I say to anyone who supports BDS, if you know anyone with multiple sclerosis, you're going to ask them to give up their drugs so that you can have your political position. And it goes beyond that because uh, that particular company has factories and, and distribution networks in the UK. I always say that those companies should be shut down as well. So it goes on. Um, so I think there are very strong arguments from, from that perspective. But I also think we need to be very much on our guard in the UK as well by BDS by default. And I mentioned earlier on the Emirates airline contract, the cable car that Boris Johnson set up, and he signed this contract, which had a BDS clause in it. Shows how much detail he pays the detail. That contract not only forbade the mayor, but forbade. Every no, okay. It was Marwan Farghouti who actually says that the um, the objective of BDS is to demonise Israel, to delegitimise Israel in order to destroy Israel. And therefore, I find it absolutely extraordinary that two candidates running for London Assembly don't have any view on it whatsoever. And I think you should reconsider your, your view on that and to give a clear answer to the audience here as to whether you're for it or against it. Yes, I'm happy to do that. I just didn't actually understand what the initial stood for um, when it was passed along, nor did my colleague. Um, UKIP has a very strong pro-Israel. Boycott, divestment, sanctions. Yeah. Um, Israel, UKIP has a very strong pro-Israel policy and has done for many, many years. Um, we're in favor of a two-state solution in the Middle East, but we're certainly not in favor of the BDS movement, which singles out Israel over all the other countries in the world who may or may not be committing acts which are um, not in favor with a particular country ourselves. We should be, if we were going to have this movement, we should have it against many, many other countries long before we ever got to Israel. Israel's about halfway down the list, if not lower down. Um, I, I've seen over the years that universities have become more and more anti-Semitic and people, Jewish children who've gone there, youngsters, have reported back how anti-Semitic it, it's become. And, and both Tory and Labour governments have totally ignored that. And in many cases, they've encouraged extremists into the country, and they haven't monitored what goes on in the Muslim schools. So, you know, it's not surprising that we're now facing the difficulties. This is a long, it's been a long time reaping the whirlwind. Thank you. Okay. This comes to the end of our questions, and... Um, one quick, and it really is good. Okay. I would always say... On the stage... Uh, when they came into power, invite uh, organizations to come and address 
the London Assembly, i.e. Uh, banned organisation or what's deemed as a terrorist organisation. Okay. I'm only going to take the question if the answer is yes or no. <laughs> or we can discuss this another time. That's the third option, okay? We are really out of time. We've gone over time. And um, I'm an American. There's a stickler for time. I really would like everybody to feel that this has been yes handled in a no. prompt manner. Um, and I respect your time as well and the candidate's time. So if you could just repeat the question. If they would allow any organization <coughs> Banned organization, Band organization or terrorist organization, or terrorist organization to host a stage with them or be invited to the GLA. <coughs> okay, or can be invited to GLA or host a stage with them. Yes, no, or we can discuss it another time. Okay? <laughs> right. No, really, that's going to be the answer. Okay? <laughs> no, of course not. Okay. No, of course not. The, I think the only organization that runs an invited is Zodek, who are invited oh, for, a, no. for a, 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 a celebration of their work. Which Which is I think it's a very long no. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'll try to keep my answers brief and I'll continue no. Okay, thank you. John. No. No. Good grief. What are you asking? Ergo used to be listed as a terrorist organization. We should talk. Okay. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do very quickly, I'm going to take you through this. We're going to have closing remarks from the candidates, 90 seconds each. Um, Really, please keep to this time frame, and we're going to go in the reverse order of the way it started. So we're going to start with Dan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the questions and concerns raised tonight illustrate that we need an assembly member who understands local governments and the issues of housing, transport, crime, and community cohesion. And housing is a huge issue, and as a councillor, I've overseen the delivery of thousands of new homes, affordable homes to buy and to rent. I'm the only candidate to have had real responsibility over public services and large council budgets. I've balanced the council's books, I've cut council tax, and I've overseen a 20% increase in resident satisfaction. And those achievements were not made by being pressured by those who shout the loudest, but by understanding what residents really want. And if I'm your assembly member, I shall be lobbying the mayor on the issues that are most important to you, not my party. As a councillor, I've stood up for many Jewish residents on matters such as faith schools, burial space, and anti-Semitism. I'm proud of the great diversity of London and the excellent community work carried out by the three synagogues that are in my ward. And if I'm your assembly member, I will put you ahead of any party or trade union interests. If I'm your assembly member, if the unions are being unreasonable and threaten to cause chaos with transport strikes, I will not remain silent. I will speak out on your behalf. If there is a controversial proposal about a cycle superhighway, I will not remain silent. I will speak out on your behalf. And I will speak out against anti-Semitism, supporting a zero-tolerance approach to all hate crime. And I will continue to publicly condemn anti-Semitism wherever it may be. I have the experience and local understanding to represent you at City Hall and ensure Barnet and Camden gets the resources it needs. Let's continue London's success by having a conservative city hall working with a conservative government. Thank you for your questions. Um, UKIP is a very much smaller party than the Conservatives or Labour, but what we would like to do is get a few people on the London Assembly will probably come through proportional representation, which you probably know is part of the voting procedure uh, for the London Assembly. And we will then hold them to account and make sure that they do the stuff that they promise to do. Because I'm proud to live. My neighbour is part of Jewish. And I'd like when you get the new here, cries um, asking you to uh, rise up or um, take measures to it, which might disrupt the community, to think of the words of my neighbour, Lenny Hoffman. Lord Hoffman, the real threat to the life of the nation and the sense of people living in accordance with its traditional laws and political values comes not from terrorism, but from laws such as these. I'm very proud that he's my neighbour who struck down the anti-terrorism laws. Thank you. Andrew. Yes, well, I, I think, first of all, I'd say that I, I have been and will continue to be an assembly member for both boroughs. And that means taking up issues in both boroughs, not just uh, the West Ham said Tube, for example, but big issues like HS2, where I've uh, petitioned the House of, House of Commons, I've nearly finished my petition in the House of Lords, I've appeared before the House of Commons Committee to represent residents. 
uh, and there are smaller issues like most recently the Parliament Hill Cafe campaign, mm. uh, which I'm pleased to see has been successful so far. And on the CS11, I've made my position clear on that. I've, and I've actually put in written representations about it. I don't think any of the other candidates have done that. Um, I suspect probably not. So this job is about holding the mayor to account. It means being able to question the mayor, to challenge the mayor, and to put forward proposals to the mayor. And I think I've shown that I've been able to do that successfully over the last four years. In the last few seconds, I'd just like to end by referring to the one bit of the manifesto we did talk about, which is the cultural heritage and social action. And one thing I think is really important is that we do reflect on London's wonderful Jewish heritage. And one of the things that I've been trying to do, and unfortunately not with Boris Johnson in charge, is to get London and partners, whose job it is to publicise London to, for outside investment and outside tourism, to do something about promoting Jewish heritage. Because I think we ought to be able to, on the anniversary of Cable Street, 9th of October this year, to actually do something to commemorate Jewish cultural heritage. And I'd like to see us have a Jewish cultural trail built on the back of that anniversary so that people who come to London, other Jewish faith or otherwise, who are interested in that heritage, can actually follow a trail and look around all the wonderful things in the East End and everywhere else that commemorate Jewishness in our capital. Fantastic. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's been a nice, energised debate. It's a shame it's been an all-male panel, but, Joel, I feel like you've more than oh, handled... Uh, uh, <laughs> I feel like you've more than kept it in all of this, so thank you very much. Um, one of my favourite thinkers and intellectuals of kind of well, uh, my time of life is uh, the former chief rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs. He has a, a book he's written called The Home That We Built Together that I've been reading recently. I won't repeat the whole argument because I'm sure people in the room are aware of it, but very quickly... The idea is that you can build a society or build a home in a certain way. You can build it like a B&B, where people stay in your society, but they have to live by your rules. This is how they said that um, Jews coming over and, and the Irish, kind of a little bit later on, were treated at first, not straight away uh, cohesive in society, but with a little bit of the, these, are, these ideas are strange. You can live as a hotel, which is a bit more what we have now, which is where you all have your corners of society, and everyone has their own rules, and people generally get along, but it's not really a home. But then what you can really have is a home which is a cohesive society, which is an intercultural society, where everyone has their heritage, and I would absolutely support Andrew's call to support Jewish heritage for Hanukkah in the Square, for instance, in Trafalgar Square. Fantastic initiative. But I think we need to be reaching out to communities more. And one way we can do that are some of our Liberal Democrat policies we've been talking about today, building 200,000 homes so uh, rent prices can come down, so people can actually get on that housing ladder. Tackling air pollution so we can actually breathe the air in London and it's not dangerous or causing premature deaths. And making sure that we have police on the streets, local community policing, so we know the police officers and we can really tackle hate crime and anti-Semitism. The constituency is often called a two-horse race because it's always been won by a Labour or Tory candidate. I would ask this personal request from you. I'm also on the Assembly list. You have three votes uh, on May 5th. If you could okay. vote, if you uh, think I've said anything yeah, vaguely four. sensible tonight and you'd like to support a Jewish Assembly candidate, if you could vote Caroline Pigeon's Liberal Democrats on the orange ballot paper, that would be a support for liberalism and a support for Israel and a support for Judaism. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, it's been an interactive evening. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming because without you, we would just be a very lonely group around a campfire. And um, also like to thank the candidates for taking time out of their schedules, busy schedules, to come and join us this evening. Um, the London Jewish Forum, specifically Joe Vincent, the director, who has put so much work into organizing the representation of the Jewish community um, in the lead up to the mayoral candidacy and also in general in terms of the future of the Jewish community. Um, and I'd like to end with uh, just a concept of what citizenship really means. Um, certainly as a Jew, and I'm personally a religious Jew, and so for me, it's not just about my own personal identity, but the country that I live in. As it happens, I'm also American, and we have a very exciting election happening right now. This is nothing, okay? <laughs> this is nothing, okay? okay. Um, but the concept of uh, being in a country and living here um, I'm also an Israeli <coughs> citizen, as it happens, and so therefore I have a number of different residences, identities, and the, the feeling that I have that unites all of them is ownership. And as a resident here, as somebody who lives here, as a citizen here as well, there is a feeling of responsibility to the representatives of the city and of the government, 
and mine toward them and them toward us. And I hope this evening has given all of us some sense of, some sense of that ownership. So I'd like to thank everybody, and especially JW3 for hosting a really wonderful evening. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody in the next three weeks to circulate the, the London Jewish Manifesto through social media, through your friends, download it, <coughs> share it please, take more copies, give it out, post it the old fashioned way, whatever it is, discuss it around your tables. And I'll finish with a Jewish thought, like Mordechai said to Queen Esther, if you don't vote, if you don't do it, somebody else will. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a good